Mothers are the queens of the castle, but let's be real. It's not all ball gowns and glass slippers. On this podcast, we're giving you a peek behind the throne at the privilege and responsibility of wearing the crown. My name is Helen Hope Kimbrough, and I'm a proud wife and mom of two adult sons. And I'm Charlita Hatch, a proud wife, married to my high school sweetheart, and a proud mom to two little ones. Get ready as we share jewels with each other and you around all things connected to motherhood. Hello, everyone. Good to be back on the mic with my girl, Charlita. Mic check. Yes, mic check. Today, we are actually going to talk about maternal health, but specifically Black maternal health. Um, And we also want to kind of share our birth stories today. Um, This will be um, an episode that we hope to have uh, another segment to discuss further, but this will just be the preliminary episode that we talk about today. So it's going to be a serious topic for us to delve into. Um, Again, you know, I always have to level set and do all of these things. So uh, what is maternal uh, health and maternal mortality specifically? Uh, is what we want to talk about, is really around um, mothers who die from pregnancy-related health issues or existing conditions exacerbated by pregnancy. Uh, Something that was quoted by the CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, the the maternal mortality rate for 2021 uh, was 32.9 deaths per 100,000 live births compared with a rate of 23.8 in 2020 and 20.1 in 2019. Now that's just regularly for just maternal health um, overall. For black women face a much higher risk of maternal death. Um, It's 69.9 deaths per 100,000 live births among black women in the U.S. in 2021. So, and, and and black women are basically two to three times more likely to die yes. in childbirth than yes. any other than any other group. So, thirty-two point nine per sixty-nine point nine. That's telling, and so that's what we're here to actually talk about, dive into, and discuss today. So, when you hear those statistics, Charlita, what comes to mind? Fear. Mm-hmm. And even though I'm done with my childbirth thing, mm-hmm. it's it's just the fear. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you start thinking about the systems that are in place that are not like what is it about it that would cause Black women to die at two to three times higher the rate? You know, our voice is not being heard. You know, not attentive to the care. Um, there's probably some health factors on the Black mm-hmm. woman side, mm-hmm. and. Um, how do you? How do we prevent that? And I think that's what we wanted to talk about. And I think humanizing those statistics is is a way to do it. Um, so for me, um, I had I think age is also important. So I was pregnant with my son at 32, and that was in 2017. And I have high blood pressure, and I also have Crohn's disease. So I was high risk even before I was advanced maternal age, which we'll get into with Amelia. Mm-hmm. And um, throughout my pregnancy, was monitoring my blood pressure was and my Crohn's. So I would go to my OB um, once a month, and then I would go to the high-risk doctor. Um, so that was being monitored. I didn't have any of the, um, I forget what it's called, gestational diabetes, so I didn't have that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... My blood pressure started to spike, maybe started towards the, my third tri- towards the end of my third trimester, and so they had already said that they would take Mark at thirty nine weeks. They were like, "There's no value in keeping him in and just giving your risk factors. There's only risk to keeping him in longer." So um, I knew I was going to be induced. I was completely fine with that. Um, the type A person in me just didn't have to deal with the water breaking. So I go and get induced on a Friday and it doesn't work. And so um, Saturday they do another type of induction. It doesn't work. And at this point you're not eating, you know, you're in labor. Sunday uh, one of the doctors came in and said, we're just going to go old school, go ahead and get up. 
and start walking the halls every 30 minutes with your husband. Um, so they took me off all of the um, the uh, instruments, Monitor. monitors. Mm -hmm. And then they made me do the bouncy ball oh, <laughs> and yeah. just doing all the things. And he just was not ready to come out. Mm -hmm. Sunday night, they broke my water. And um, I would say at that point, you know, this is day three, man in the hospital. That's when I started to go into labor. And so there's this thing they have with the contraction monitors. And what I think is interesting, and this I think is just probably indicative of just black women, I never felt the contractions. They kept what? saying, you're contracting. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? I'm like, no. I, I was like, and it was in my head. I'm like, am I this out of tune with my body? Like, what is happening? Now, once like I got to 8.5 centimeters, that was the very first contraction I felt. Okay. So that whole time, I never got an epidural or anything, but it wasn't because I was trying not to. I mean, I was trying to get an epidural my entire pregnancy. <laughs> It just, I didn't feel the contraction. So at 8.5, I'm like, oh, I think I felt it. And I felt all I needed to feel, but like the epidural now. And they were trying to convince me not to get the epidural. They were like, you're so close. I'm like, I I would like an epidural. So we get into Monday morning. I, I have the epidural. And uh, the doctor comes in. It's like, you've been in here too long, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, we're going to start getting this baby out. So I didn't know anything about like labor down and like all of those things. I immediately go, they're trying to get me to push. Mark's holding my legs. The other nurse is holding the leg. They're trying to get me to push. And Mark gets stuck. Mm. So he gets stuck in the birth canal. He poops in the birth canal. He flips. Does He does team too much. He flips in the birth canal. My epidural runs out. And I'm like looking at Mark, husband Mark, and I'm like, I cannot do this. I'm not, I can't do it. And I, I don't think I started crying, but I was just you like, he saw, yeah, I was morning. tired. I was exhausted. He saw me and he was like, we got to do something different. So they literally said, let's take a break, a break from labor. Let's try to just do a reset and do like a 30 minute. And just think about that, where I tell people that story, they're like, they did what? They didn't try to move to a C-section, whatever. No. And so I'm now still in labor, wombs open, all the things. They, we take a break. I don't even know what that's not a thing that you you're supposed to do. You don't even know that's your baby. Oh, right. Or, or, or black maternal health yeah. or me. Yeah. Then they say, okay, you know, his head, the way it is. We can do two things. We can do uh, forceps oh. or we can do a C-section. And everybody tells you to try not to get a C-section. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what forceps were. Oh, yeah. But I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, we just try forceps. And then they bring the things in there. And, they <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> there, is, there is no turning back. But they get Mark out. Because he pooped in the birth now, he had to have a respiratory thing. My my husband really thought something was wrong with him. It was a delay in crying. They rushed him, rushed, and I told him, go with Mark. Mm -hmm. And so they rushed Mark. They kept him in the room, but they were doing all the things to check on him. And then with me, it was, uh, there was a lot going on, but I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I... Ended up, and the same thing happened with my daughter. I hemorrhaged, and I was hemorrhaging. Mm. And uh, you could think about what I just said about, you know, being in labor four days, um, having to take a break in the middle of labor. Uh, you know, I didn't all even of those. that was an option. It doesn't even sound logical, yeah. right? That mm -hmm. that would be an option. Yeah. I'm hemorrhaging. I end up having it, blood transfusions. Um, I had a third-degree tear. I ended up ha developing sciatica out of that, um, and I was also had, and I'm I'm sure everybody has it, but I was mentally and emotionally traumatized by that experience. And then you, I think that that impacted Mark as a baby. He was never settled as a baby. 
I cried all the time. He has sensory issues now. But I think his birth experience was also traumatizing mm-hmm. to his system. Oh, yeah. And was never regulated. Mm-hmm. Neither of us were ever regulated or cared for. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a big reason of why there was a four and a half year age gap because I never forgot standing up, mm-hmm. trying to walk to the for the first time to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. I never forgot any of those things. Yeah. I remember all of it and not feeling like there was a lot of care. There was no harm done, mm-hmm. but just thinking about if you take a step back, you're you're basically in the hospital for four days trying to have, have a baby. You're uninformed. Mm-hmm. You don't know how to advocate because you don't know what to advocate for. Yeah. You're hoping that the doctor is helping you. You tell them you're in pain. They tell you, you got it. Mm-hmm. You're like, no, I don't. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. it was just a lot, a lot of, um, to me, it was very traumatizing. Mm-hmm. And I know when I have told some of my girlfriends this story, they were like, yo, this is absolutely egregious and ridiculous. And I, I would never allow this to happen. And they didn't look like me, right? And I'm like, I did not know. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that that was kid one. How about you? Thanks for sharing. And I mean, I knew some of your story, but I didn't know like all of the elements of your story. And you're right. I mean, like I'm every every time I hear a story like this, I'm always like, what in the what? Like what is happening here? Which is why I normally don't share mine, specifically to new moms. If I know, I'm like, and they all say, how? And I'm like, I will refrain. Like, I will let not me just share. say, I also think not sharing, though, mm-hmm. like we don't want to scare moms. Mm-hmm. But I think that when we don't share, mm-hmm. we don't know one what's normal or how to learn from the journey mm-hmm. either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because yep. everything just seems like, oh, the baby just pops out. You know, well, I, <laughs> like I will, the fact no, that I didn't well, know what forceps were. Yeah. It, it, I went to the doctor every two weeks my yep. entire pregnancy. Yeah. Why didn't I know what that was? Yeah. Well, I don't I don't want to say that it's for that reason because I don't want people to think that it's normal. Like, I mean, I know when my husband and I started this journey, we would talk about death in delivery because I'm like, you know, you are closest to death when you are delivering a baby. And he cuz he would say, "Why are we talking about this?" And I'm like, Men. "That's something that's important yeah. to talk about." That what are you going to do? Like, we need to have like these conversations. I will share that with moms, but I specifically don't share like what my journey was because I know it's going to be different. Yeah, that's true. For someone else. It's not going to be like mine. And, um, but I will just say my pregnancy with Austin was glorious. It was beautiful, magical, 29 years old. And I'm like, man, you cannot tell me that this is not a beautiful pregnancy that we're having here. No morning sickness, tired, exhausted, but I can deal with that. Um, The whole color of me changed. So I was as black as my hair. I was like, what is going on here? So he took all my pigment. Um, And, but then when we got down to the labor, um, I felt like my water broke. And so I went to the doctor. I was like, I think my water broke. They were like, no, your water didn't break. Um, go, uh, you know, they send you back home. So you go back home. And I was like, but something in me was like, no, nah, I think my water broke. Uh, Marcus was in school at the time, working on his MBA. And um, and he had just gotten home. And I'm like, you know what? We're going to the hospital because I, I do think my water broke. And I'm starting to feel contractions like right now. So... He and I, we go to the hospital, and I think because my pregnancy was so glorious that my delivery would have been glorious. That's where I was wrong. And we get there, and um, Thursday night, middle of the night, and I can't, I mean, I think I dilated four centimeters. Like, I couldn't go beyond that. And, but... Um, Austin's heart rate kept going down Mm -hmm. and we're not understanding why the heart rate is going down. So the hospital where we were, um, and this was in Cincinnati, uh, they, it was a teaching hospital 
And so uh, even my uh, practice that I was using, even the doctor who she's already said it'll be a teaching hospital, but there will be a rotation of doctors that will come and check on you. Nobody could understand like why the heart rate was dropping, why the heart rate was dropping. Fortunately, she came to the hospital and she's like, oh, you know, just doing my rotations and checking. And and um, and I said, you know, what's going on? I said, you know, we've been here. The heart rate keeps dropping. And I said, all these doctors, everybody's checking in inside, right? Everybody's checking inside. Can nobody figure it out? She does one check. Oh, the cord is wrapped around your baby's neck. That's why the heart rate is dropping. Oh, my God. All that time, all those people. And she uh, looks at me and she's like, okay, I want you to know that we're going to have to do an emergency C-section. And I was like, but I wanted to deliver it vaginally. Again, pipe dream, right? She's like, that's not happening today. You won't be able to do that. We're going to have to do an emergency C-section. And when I press this button, I want you to know that a team of doctors are coming in this room. I love that bedside manner. It was like eight people. There were two on the side of my legs, two in front, two behind, and two like other people on the outside. They threw Marcus some scrubs. He's the one who's telling me about it. I didn't know. Threw him some scrubs. They roll me into emergency, and all I know is, you know, the mask goes over your face, and I wake up, and, you know, there's a baby. But Marcus's story, and I felt for him, too, because he's like, I didn't get to participate. Like, I didn't get to be there. I mean, they threw me these scrubs, and then the door closes, and I didn't know, like, if I was going to see you again. Like, I didn't know. So it's the trauma that he also experienced that I feel for him too, like in that case, because you don't know what's going to happen. You see all of these people around your wife rolling down and it's supposed to be like a joyful, you know, moment. But I was just so grateful that she came. She wasn't even supposed to be in the hospital that day. She came, she diagnosed quickly, went into action quickly. And although it was something that I didn't think I would want it. She's like, no, this is this what is what need? you needed. And so from that, you know, point on, um, you know, Marcus is there. I can hardly talk. And I mean, I, I knew he was hallucinating when he came in and it's just like, babe, babe, we're gonna have to do this again because I didn't I didn't get to participate. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> I cannot talk right now. I am in a whole different experience. I don't even know what you're talking about. I was like, no, not 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 the time. Oh my god! Um, but you know all of those things. But I would say that I'm grateful to her for that. But I'm also grateful that, like a year later, she and I we really sat down and talked about that day. Oh wow! And she said, I just want to. She says, and even when I would go to the, you know, my birth visits in between there, she's like, I don't know who you serve, but you serve somebody mighty and you serve somebody great because you are literally not supposed to be here. Your son is not supposed to be here. Both of you are here for a higher reason, purpose that I don't know because I can't explain why. And for her to share that and she didn't have to share that was also like incredible to me. And so, I mean, shout out Dr. Claudia Harsh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, you were like my best ambassador, advocate, um, change agent, like in that moment. And I know my family and I will be forever grateful to you. I love that. Shout out to to Dr. Claudia because uh that was that was powerful. And there were two things that you said that I wanted to add on to. One, I think just the I would be interested in our our moms that are not black that listen. Is the fear conversation around birth the same? Because I remember getting a whole documentation together for Mark of like, here's all the people you need to call, here's all the information, and basically telling them like if there's a choice, you know. 
pick the baby. Like, don't ever leave the baby. Like, I didn't know enough that they do everything in the room now. Mm-hmm. Yep. For us, they do. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it was the same. But they they didn't they don't take the baby out the room um, anymore. Well, they yeah they did take the they baby don't even out do of, the nursery anymore. Yeah, they did they, take the baby out of the room. Still making um, keep your child even in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I said the same thing that you said. I said whatever you do, you go with the baby. Mm-hmm. Like I'll be okay. I was also the worried they would try to switch them. <laughs> Well, like I on mean, the TV show, I was like, "You follow that baby, <laughs> make sure it's ours, girl." <laughs> do we do we have the same upbringing? Because I feel the same way. That's why you follow the baby. <laughs> <laughs> but just you know, he can't mm-hmm. advocate for himself. I can try to do what I can do here. But the other thing is, so with my second, so with Amelia, I had. Um, High blood pressure, Crohn's, but I was also now high risk because of age. So I was in the mm-hmm. advanced maternal age or geriatric pregnancy. So they said before with little Mark, they were like, we're taking him at 39 weeks. At Amelia, I already knew they were taking her at 38 weeks. So oh, wow. I, I knew that. Um, and with her- Did you change doctors, by the way? Yes. Okay. Um, and was actually a little bit more intentional about black care. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was other reasons for that. So one- I did not have the fear of being a black woman giving birth when I had my son in 2017, but being pregnant, getting pregnant in 2020 and most of the pregnancy being in 2021, there was this absolute fear over me around dying because all of the information was now made available to me in a way that I had not sought out before. It just came to me and I really thought for sure I'm going to die. I'm black, I'm a mama, I got high blood pressure, it's the pandemic. You know, like I just had a fear. And so I knew I needed to have black care. And so uh, it just so happened that uh, there was a midwife at our church Mm. that was a part of the rotating practice. And she saw me after Mark was born, but I didn't know she was a midwife at Mm. the time. So I was intentional about being under her care um, and tried to see her as much as possible. However, when they scheduled my induction, she was off. Oh, God. And I remember calling her and sharing with her that, um, you know, hey, I'm here. I'm getting checked in. And she said, who's on call? And I told her and she said, okay. And then she appeared and she got the team there and she d- navigated my birth the journey uh together and it was a completely different experience it wasn't chaotic i learned the term labor down and you know all of those things um and i still um hemorrhaged and she ended up calling in a doctor but what i remember the most about amanda is that the doctor kept trying to leave and amanda was like no she's not good <laughs> but they were saying it in a way that was like medical, like, oh, yeah. well, can you check his? Can you check this? Mm-hmm. But really, she's like, she cannot, you cannot leave. Yep. Um, and so I just think to me, what I would say, whether it's right, wrong, or different, representation matters. It, it matters in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And it is good to have a team, at least one person on the team that you know is going to advocate for you in a different way mm-hmm. um, and making sure that th- that they're looking out for the factors that will make make sure you and your baby get out alive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. And it made the difference, you know, in your care like the second time. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I called you like right after it and you were like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. You were in a better place this time than you were. She called time. me still in the traumatized. She <laughs> was. She was still in trauma. She was still in trauma. But. I was like, this happened, this happened, this happened. <laughs> but, <laughs> but still, mm-hmm. it was, I knew that I was covered mm-hmm. in a different way, not only through God, but then mm-hmm. also through, you know, it's having that black hair. Yeah. And so, you know, one thing that I would want people to walk away from this is, what Helen said earlier is that everybody's journey is going to be different and not everybody's is going to be traumatic and chaotic and all of that, but it is a miracle Mm -hmm. to bring life into this world. Mm -hmm. And we know that when it comes to black women specifically, most things related to health, Mm -hmm. um, we are not always um, 
on the positive side of those yeah. things. Yeah. And so what we want to do this season is to make sure that we're educating along the way. We want to start with our stories, but in future episodes, we want to talk about how do you advocate? What questions do you have? What are some of the levers that you can pull Mm -hmm. um, so that you can not only, if you're past this phase of life, you can share it with the other women around you as they navigate through it um, so that we can educate ourselves a little bit differently um, in the community. No, I agree. I agree. And I just feel like this was just so important, you know, for us to talk about. Um, and yet again, to have that continued dialogue, um, I didn't talk about my second son, but that pregnancy, that's where I did have the gestational diabetes. And so just the, some of the things that I navigated to make certain that my health was prioritized and that um, not doing the standard of making um doing the, what is it, the diabetic shots that you, I mean, even though I had to test my diabetes, um, I decided to exercise three times a day. I decided to eat 1,100 calories. Yeah, on an 1,100 calorie count diet. Um, And that was under doctor's care because I was just like, no, I'm just going to do it this way instead of doing some of the other things that you guys are suggesting. And, um, and I just think I was just better for it having that approach, um, being, because I didn't want to have diabetes later. They'll say, oh, as soon as you have the baby gestational diabetes, it leaves your body. Okay. You say that right now. What is it going to look like 10 years from now? What is it going to look like 15 years from now? I don't know. So I'm just going to go the way that I know right now. And again, when you're more informed, you make better decisions like for you and yourself. People thought I was crazy working out three times a day, eating, you know, a limited calorie count, but I just knew it was just going to be best for me and then best for my son. And, um, and he also ended up, um, being delivered by C-section and a great doctor in New Jersey at this time, uh, who was a long-term friend of mine and I'm grateful to her too. So I did just at least want to shout out her, um, as well um, in New Jersey too. I love that. So we're going to get into this topic even more. So if if you have a birth story that you want to share, we'd love to hear it. Um, If you have an upcoming birth, we'd actually love to pray pray for you and and with you. So be sure to like, comment, or subscribe and and stay tuned for future episodes where we talk more about Black maternal health. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Behind the Throne podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and comment below with your feedback. Check out future episodes from us as we discuss motherhood from babies to adults.